BioTalk, a GBAC TV production. My co-host is Patty Olinger, the executive director of GBAC. And joining us today are John Cordier and Mark Hernandez, both serving on the GBAC Scientific Advisory Board. Our topic today is what the lifting of mass mandates means for facilities and especially for indoor air quality efforts. We've seen it in the news, as masks come off, some may fear that we're now breathing air that was previously filtered by our masks, at least to some degree. So Patty, start us off. What, tell us this, what is the CDC doing now about mask mandates and what are you seeing across the country? You know, this is something that we really had anticipated at some point in time. And we knew that when the mass mandates across the country and really across the world were going to be starting to be lifted, that there was going to be a period of time where there's going to be question, those gray areas, um, and and well, as well as anxiety with the society in general. Um, this has not been a short time frame that we have been, you know, dealing with this pandemic um, with SARS-CoV-2. It's been two years now. And to go from, you know, a situation where you have mass mandates, especially when you have people gathering, uh, and to not having that mass mandates, you start asking those questions. What other things are already in place? What we've been talking about here at GBAC with indoor air quality considerations, as well as hygienic cleaning um, to support even our indoor air quality um, uh, uh, considerations are in place to keep us safe. Well, thank you, Patty. Um, let's talk to you, Mark. Tell us this. Does anything surprise you about the CDC and other authorities' decisions on lifting mask requirements or lifting other safety protocols? Well, I'll I'll start with the, with the mask and it's not surprising and it's data-driven, right? So um, there's a threshold below which in terms of case counts or rates of case declination that in a thoughtful way they've decided, okay, it's time. Um, and uh, we knew it was coming, we didn't know when, but um, I'm, I'm as sure as I can be, it's data driven and I, I trust the call on it. Does it, uh, you know, change the risk horizon for those of us indoors? Yes, no doubt about it. We just don't know what that is. All right, and what about you, John? What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I'll echo a little bit what Mark said. Uh, it's something that we can plan for, it is data driven. And the one thing to consider is that lifting a mask mandate and why it's not happening at the same time in every single geography across the entire US, um, that also should be expected. Knowing that the epidemic is at a different stage, uh, there's different wave patterns of highs and lows month by month across the country by location. Um, I think the same as mask mandates being taken away at different time points, there might be stages of the epidemic in the late fall in different geographies where you might see a mass requirement come back into play and it might be in some geographies, but not others. Um, the idea that masks work and that we are at a greater risk if everyone isn't wearing a mask, that would also be true. But it's all about balancing the risk on the time of the year and where people are gathering. So what I'm hearing is don't throw away your mask. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd say like one, you know, one point is, you know, last year at about the same time, cases were trending downward, but then there was a, an increase in cases in some locations across the country in the early summer, namely in southeastern states. And then later on in late August, September, you saw cases beginning to increase in other geographies. And so it's, yeah, hold, hold on to your mask. And it might just be a, oh, it's October in Chicago. I'm going to start wearing my mask again. Um, same as like if it's you know February in Colorado and you're headed to the mountains, I'm going to bring a winter coat. Uh, I think that that could become somewhat normalized. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's doing much traveling lately, but I know in airports and airplanes, you still have to wear them. I could see that lasting a while longer than maybe other buildings. Right now, we still have to wear them in airplanes. Yeah. Uh, any, any thoughts there? Absolutely. I think you're going to see certain situations as, as both John and Mark indicated that you will one see 
um, the requirements still be there. And obviously public transportation is one of them. The other is to keep in mind, you know, we learned kind of, a well, we learned a very valuable lesson in this last year. Um, masks do work. And that also that we have to take a, a, a little bit of personal responsibility to decide Okay, if I'm immunocompromised and I'm going into a situation where there's a lot of people and I don't know the status of um, their um, their status, I may need to you know consider wearing a mask or maybe I have a family member that's immunocompromised. Uh, again, with that epi, epi study and the epidemiological um, data that's out there that um, epistemics um, eloquently will will show. Um, you know, what is the demographics of where I'm going? Um, what's the, you know, vaccination rates in the areas that I'm going? These are all pieces of the puzzle that are now available to us and that really make a big difference. Um, and then from a business standpoint, getting to that topic of indoor air quality, we've learned a lot there. And, you know, that's something that, you know, I know Mark has, has looked at very intently with the research that he does at University of Colorado. Well, let's go there. Let's talk to Mark about that. Um, from your experience and what you know, what does the cleaning industry need to know about their part of indoor air quality efforts? Uh, I, I mean, I think, I think they know what they need to know. That is cleaning is important, right? And how we clean, what we clean with, the cycles between occupancy and so on. And it's, it's even more important now if we're gonna take off our masks, right? Um, uh, I, I think the research horizon on cleaning or, or enhanced better cleaning practices um, is, is wide open, uh, COVID or not. Um, and I, I, I think, unfortunately, COVID catalyzed uh, um, something that should have been done a long time ago. And, you know, how we clean, what we clean with the other metrics that I, I just recited to you. Uh, there's an aspect of this that's still also a question. Yeah, sure, we know COVID and other viruses uh, can spread by long range airborne transmission, you know, beyond casual contact. We, we learned that relearn that the hard way. We knew this about flu and other things in the past, TB and so on. But um, what, what the cleaning industry uh, does, and the, the open question is, and we call this the R word in, in indoor air quality science, resuspension. Stuff settles. It can last for a long time, but depending on environmental conditions, some of which John outlined, right? How long things last in dry air in high mountainous Colorado is very different than, say, in the uh, warm air, warm, humid air of the southeast. But we've got this question about resuspension and cleaning gets to that. How we clean, how often, what we clean with um, really gets to this arresting resuspension issue. And that mm -hmm. that covers other things, right? Allergens, um, things that people are hypersensitive to and so on that are actually um, present co uh, uh, mortalities with these other things like COVID and flu. So um, I, I think there has to be renewed attention and um, more research efforts into the uh, policies and practices around cleanings. And you mentioned it, particularly in high density environments like public transportation vehicles, transportation hubs, and so on. John, anything to add? No, just to, uh, well, yes. Uh, I'd say that the high contact rate areas, that might be where you do see protocols last longer than others, whether that might be at an airport, mm -hmm. uh, whether it might be a subway station, whatever that might be. Um, the other thing around cleaning and like a, a refocus or reemphasis on it, there are going to be other viruses that are different than the coronavirus that might behave differently, the longer distance type transmission. And that's where cleaning and other protocols can come into play. And it's just knowing what's, what's out there in the population, the population that's showing up in the indoor spaces that people are gathering in, and then being able to match protocols to it. 
and to not be so alarmed where it's like, oh, we need to have more sanitation stations. We need to have um, an increase in the number of cleaning staff at different times of the year. Those things should become almost as predictable as the weather when we're looking at disease forecasting over time. I will say uh, I was visiting with the, some friends recently and their kids had something like a cold, like a common cold. And we're like, that's what you got. You don't have COVID. So <laughs> it's kind of funny how we think now, um, but we have to remember, and you both, you've all talked about it. Other viruses, other issues are still there and we'll be paying more attention to them once COVID is in the past, or at least in the endemic stage. Point: What can everyone do to help? With the move from pandemic to endemic, anything to to think to share there, uh, John? What do you think? Yeah, I'll I'll start. So um, let's look at the word epidemic. So epidemic, what it really means is upon the people, um, epi and demos, and endemic is within the people, um, n and demos. And when we look at what that difference is. Um, endemic is really there's enough immunity within a population where we're not going to see large spikes in hospitalizations and deaths because we have gathered enough immunity. Um, there are four other common cold coronaviruses that probably every single person on the planet has been exposed to by the time they're you know, reaching elementary school, more or less. And it's Variants and changes in some of the common cold coronaviruses that might lead to a spike in flu one year or another. But as we move from the COVID-19 pandemic or epidemic that is happening to the population or to the people, as we move towards endemic, it's really something that we all would have been exposed to. We all have some level of immunity to, and that's when we should see you know, COVID-19 become the fifth common cold coronavirus. And, and I think that's how it'll ultimately end up getting classified. Although there are alternatives um, where the virus can mutate in different ways to behave like other viruses, where maybe the next time you're exposed, you, are, you have a more severe case. That's one possibility. The other thing about coronaviruses that are tricky is their ability to jump between species. And if you have um, high contacts with populations of people, who are in contact with, whether it be livestock or other animals and coronaviruses has jumped. And then those viruses end up recombinating, mutating. That's where we end up with a probably a not so great cycle. But um, ultimately, if we, I, I think the, the path to endemic is likely to be that COVID-19 becomes the fifth common cold coronavirus in the next few years. I vote for that one compared to the other scary scenarios you were laying out there. So uh, none of it's really good, but there's some better scenarios than others. Mark, what do you think? Well, I'm going to comment on the building science side rather than the health science side. And uh, one of the things that I, I hope and starting to see come out of this is that we're actually going to monitor our buildings in terms of indexes of cleanliness, best cleaning practices, and different aspects of air quality. And the, you know, no different than um, we do now in other aspects of society, right? I have a, I, I know how many miles per gallon my car is supposed to get, but I have a gas gauge and I use it. And I, I would like to see that on buildings, you know, what are the CO2 levels, um, documentation of the cleaning practice, its frequency, and so on. So I, I'd, I'd like to see building science and um, the cleaning practitioners actually get together and come up with modern monitoring, modern documentation systems that are free and available to the public. So when I walk into a, a building, I know, you know, there's a dashboard, not something that just tells me what floor the elevator's on, but what are the carbon dioxide levels? What are the particulate monitors? Uh, particulate matter levels that I'm breathing in that building and what's customary for a, a structure and a zip code for a different, you know, certain climate. So I'm, I'm hoping we can go there. The monitoring that, you know, the, the monitoring technology is getting cheaper, better, faster. And I would really like to see that integrated um, with 
uh, better cleaning practices that are appropriate for certain times of year and so on. Um, uh, maybe a stoplight system, red, yellow, green, who knows, but monitoring and cleaning integrated both in terms of air or surfaces and so on. And I think what we'll see is enhanced or uh, better cleaning practices affect positively air quality, particles in the air and so on. Um, particularly again, in high density spaces. We're, we're piloting this with schools, but I would like to see it adopted uh, in light office and transportation hubs and so on. So that, that's my hope on the, on the building science side. And, and when that happens, the public chooses to educate themselves. If that data is available, they'll start looking at it. And well, Mark, I totally agree with you. When that data becomes much more familiar with people, they will look for it. It's sort of like when you go into a restaurant, and you look at that restaurant score, and it's Correct. like, my daughter-in-law will turn around and walk right out on certain scores. Well, um, there's some you know, early adopters out there. Some restaurants are doing this now. Some, uh, some large uh, real estate companies uh, are piloting this in light office space um, where uh, they you know, have carbon dioxide levels, PM levels, just much like the EPA does outside, but now moving this inside. Hmm. So, so, uh, so what are we looking at here for timeline? Are we thinking at another year or two, way down the road? Any thoughts there? I mean, we want to know when it sounds like. It sounds like the this, science this is there. Has, this has been implemented by early adopters. Um, yeah, you mentioned and, pilot programs, I think. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. this is, I, pilot is the wrong word. Okay. Um, they, they've adopted it, right? They, this, they have chosen to integrate as part of their business, um, their restaurant business or their light office, come back to work, um, air quality and cleaning indicators um, as, as how they're going to do business in the future. It's just you know, it, it's an economic question. It's a, it's a choice to make this part of your business model moving forward. Uh, how, how fast that spreads, I can't predict. I'm, I'm not a marketeer. I'm mm -hmm. the engineer that actually puts those monitors in and interprets that data. So I, I, I wish I had an answer for you, but I hope that's, that's, soon that's okay. Ready. Patty, I sniff an article and you get the assignment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to have some further conversations on this because that's yeah. really exciting. Um, it is. Because it's absolutely needed. But what I would love people like John in the epidemiology community to say is, hey, where we have these monitoring programs, we actually see less incidence of absenteeism. We see better productivity, less anxiety, the things that actually forward um, uh, effectiveness, whether it be work, school, or whatever it may be, I would love the epi, epi community to, to study this and say, where we monitor, we have better wellness overall, what, however you judge that, whether it be allergy, illness, or productivity. Well, John, what do you think of that? Uh, I mean, we have conversations going on uh, with Carnegie Mellon and a couple of other researchers there to talk about those exact things and to look at some projects, whether they be done by PhD students or at the Remaking Cities Institute or um, Future of Work group at Carnegie Mellon, that they're thinking about these things. Um, I mean, we've had aspirations to look at how can we for, like forecast the subjective well-being of a population that also includes what's going on in their homes and at work, not just what's going on from a disease perspective. So I think Mark is, is nailing like the future of social epidemiology as we're looking at not just epidemiology for the emergence or forecasting of disease, but the upside. So how do these interventions lead to more positive outcomes for a given population, whether that be the people who are showing up at this school or the people who are showing up in this building. So uh, I think that's also something that will be more broadly adopted. I'm going to throw out like in the next three to five years as consumers become more exposed to it. I think there's a lot of consumer education. And once, you know, if, if I'm walking into buildings with all of those types of sensors, it's going to make me feel more comfortable. And if I'm walking in somewhere else that doesn't have those, I might question things. And, and I think that's when, when you really start connecting with consumers and making it into a way that is digestible, that's going to be what, what really makes these things get more broadly adopted. Yeah. So I want to, I want to get into the science of something here. Um, when you, when I walk into a building as a consumer, as a person, not a scientist, and I see this dashboard, 
and it tells me some information that might allow me to go into the building or maybe I'm going to leave. That's on, that helps me. But what does that do for the industry? What does that do for buildings, the science? Where does that take you? I, I, I mean, on the, on the science side, it's, it's guidance for frequency of cleaning, increasing air exchange rates, installing filters and monitoring their performance, right? And we'll get used to what's normal and low risk over time. Um, and, and John brought this up earlier that, you know, depending on the physical geography, the climate, the time of year, the occupancy, those risks are going to float. But to have, you know, simple interpreted information, if, if I, as a, a, you know, an occupant see, walk into a building one day and carbon dioxide levels are double what they normally are, that would give me pause and say, hey, something's wrong today. Maybe the ventilation system's not working right. And uh, I'm going to go work at home today. Maybe something like that. And it helps facilities managers do that work. Or if VOC levels are high, hey, ventilation's not on. It didn't it didn't take the cleaning chemicals that we applied and dilute them out into uh, fresh air, things like that. I, th I think we will get used to the indicators and the ranges, just like we get used to the, you know, the, the gas gauge and the temperature gauge in our car. That's not normal. Basically. Yeah, I, I would, I would agree with that. I think it comes down to a culture of health that is emerging. So as consumers are used to seeing, uh, the gas gauge or the weather or pollen and other things in the air that from outside, it's understanding as we're going into new spaces, how can we integrate and understand the health risks of those? And if we look at monitoring as one of the tools to be used to mitigate risks for people, to inform risks, that's something that isn't a one-time, one point in time type of solution, right? It's, it's an ongoing thing where people can react and set their own risk to that over time, but it also provides more data. So um, you know, on, on my side, the epidemiology side, we're always looking for more data around prevalence and what's leading to the emergence of disease. But from a, um, I guess, a disease transmission piece, there's also the behaviors that people take. And so if we have better monitoring and can better communicate risk to people to change behaviors, to keep people healthier, yeah, I think that's a great thing. Um, and looking at monitoring as a solution that is more long-term and preventative, I think that's something that can become more normalized. But I, I also think it'll help facilities managers, right? If they, right. you know, if, if a filter's not working right, you would see it elevated particulate matter levels. Or if they didn't uh, vacuum for so many days, we would see more resuspension manifest in particulate matter levels. Um, this could also cross over to surface monitoring just with ATP, cheap swabs that are used to spot check things. If those are elevated, oh, maybe we didn't, you know, that we have to increase the cleaning frequency of these high touch surfaces that we use as sentinels of overall cleaning in a, in a building. So I think there's something not only for the occupants, but also the managers of our built environment in terms of air quality. Uh, monitoring surface cleaning effectiveness. And these tools are out there already. They're cheap, they're off the shelf, they're easy to use. It's just, we have to choose to actually integrate this into our building uh, monitoring or operational practices. Is there a cost? Yeah, but they're, they're, everything's getting better, faster, cheaper, as is evidenced by these, you know, uh, by the nest that we put in our house nowadays. We can, ex th that technology is expanding the building for real-time monitor. Yeah, so this is really exciting. I mean, I'm so excited. Um, and Jeff, you know, this is, you know, you introduced um, both Mark and John as part of the Scientific Advisory Board with GBAC and um, so happy that they're with us now. Um, and this is exactly why. These are topics that we've known are issues for that people are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. The whole aspect of we're going to be focusing on wellness and health and 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 we recognize that over this last two years is so very very important. And for me, um, when I created GBX Star, this is exactly where eventually you wanted to get to. It's not about necessarily 
You want to be there like an emergency room medical physician. When somebody needs you, you want to be there, but you want to be prepared in the event someone comes in. And this is where we're heading with this. And, and, and people want it, they need it. And for building managers and for the occupants and for customers walking into buildings, knowing when to do something, whether it surfaces air or the facility is critically important moving forward. Yeah, and I love, Mark, the example of the gas gauge because we all respond to that. It's easy to understand. So if there's something like you've been describing that we can see and respond to, what a game changer that would be. Oh, and yeah, it, and it, would, it would drive facilities. It would force them to do something about what we're seeing. And it's real time. That's the important part, right? It's real time. We're not waiting. That you're, It's not lagging the actual condition, right? These monitors uh, and networks of them are deployable and affordable nowadays. Easy for me to say, I'm not writing the checks, but um, you know, for a cup of coffee, we could monitor a room, same price, right? For, for a latte and for another price of a cup of coffee, we can install a HEPA filter in that room and up or, or actually down the, the risk of airborne particulate matter, things like that. And we can monitor in real time. So I, I think one of the things that CDC has recognized is that, you know, density matters. And we, we learned that high occupant density and the level of contact. So there's intimate contact, we're shoulder to shoulder, casual contact, we're, we're across the room. And then, um, you know, building, uh, building scale contact where ventilation is moving air from one room or containment to another. And what we've been talking about is the last two, casual contact and building scale contact. Where, where the masks become very important and still are going to is when we're shoulder to shoulder and no building science practice um, or cleaning practice is, is going to trump the risk associated with intimate contact. That's where the masks become and remain very important. And I, I think CDC's guidance about transportation hubs or other high density environments where we don't know or um, where there's travelers from all different settings really matters and the mask is going to be important. And you can always keep that mask in your, in your pocket, right? doesn't have to come on, but if you come into a high density situation or building monitors tell you, Hey, ventilation's not so good or something, the mask can come out and, you know, in a temporary case by case basis. So um, I, I, I think we're moving from uh, where we were used to, to something that was less comfortable, everybody in masks all the time, to something that's judgmental and the monitors are gonna help us.